Well, it's good to be with you today. Um, we are in a series called All This Future. We started it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Alan actually started it uh, the first Sunday of the year. Uh, and he brought a wonderful word called The Power of Momentum. If you have not uh, seen that, I would encourage you, please do that. I do think it's an important word for the year for this church body and probably beyond the body, but my primary uh, responsibility in life has to do with this crowd. And so I'm encouraging you, if you haven't seen it, please do. Out of that, two things really kind of emerged for me as the two takeaway things that I needed to anchor into. One, Alan said, resolve will be essential uh, in 2023. Uh, uh, what I have found is resolve has been essential since 2019. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, but I got a feeling it's going to be even more important as we move forward in 2023. And the second thing, and this was like such revelation to me, such a prophetic revelation. I still remember when you put up that little picture of the thing. I got it. I got it in my heart, my spirit. Um, Respond well to life's valleys and momentum will build. That, that was powerful. And it has, I think it'll be a point where I look back and say that changed things for me. Uh, now, so the question, of course, is um, what motivates resolve and uh, what fuels the capacity to respond well? And the song that we have been singing, we, we did not sing it uh, today, at least yet, maybe we will later, uh, has this one line in it that captured my attention uh, from the very beginning. I see the promise of heaven. Now, I, I feel like I need to, I had this thought come to me um, as we were worshiping. I want to say this just to, just to get it out of the way. Uh, in case there is anyone who is looking at me and thinking, poor guy. Life has dealt him some challenging circumstances over these last two years, and he's needing to know more about heaven just so he can just get through the day. No. Life has given me some challenges over the last couple of years, and it made me realize that I have not been focused enough on heaven. And I have some years yet ahead of me, and I need jet fuel. Do you hear me? I need jet fuel in the spirit because I do not intend for the next 20 years to be as challenging from a fruit-bearing perspective as the last 20 and what I have discovered is those who have shaken the earth for the kingdom were the ones who were more anchored in heaven than those who did not have so much impact. So say it with me, I'm after jet fuel. So my hope is that we will, and so what's going to happen, the more we come to take hold of the reality of eternity, of heaven, the more that becomes real to us, listen to me, the more dangerous we're going to be to the kingdom of darkness, the more impactful we're going to be for those for the kingdom of heaven. So you understand that. So I just wanted to make sure you knew you weren't, you're not listening. I'm not, I'm not some poor pathetic soul preaching to you today. I'm somebody that needs to know more about heaven. Because I need jet fuel. So, one of my favorite, you're going to love this. I saved one, I think, for next week. You're going to love this, D.L. Moody. Um, someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield, Illinois, is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher. That is all. Out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal, a body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. Can somebody say jet fuel? 
I'm telling you, I mean, the saints of old. Listen, Stephen, the first martyr of the church, rocks hitting his body, looks up into heaven and the heavens opened and he sees the son of the living God. And he just simply prayed for those who were throwing rocks. Just like his Savior, Father, they do not know what they're doing. Somebody say jet fuel. Jet fuel. Boy, that guy had some jet fuel. Love that. So I see the promise of heaven. Now, last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, I kind of introduced the idea that we're going to lean heavily upon the life of Paul as a witness of the things that we uh, want to look into. Because God seems to have used Paul more than anybody else to kind of give us this wonderful truth to draw us into. You, you, you see that? So th- this is Paul. I, uh, we, he said this in 2 Corinthians 5.8, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure who the royal we he's talking about is. We know that he's saying, I would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Listen, some, look at your neighbor and say, something was real to that guy. And then uh, a few years later, he, he writes to the Philippian uh, church. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, can I be real with you today or would you rather have a preacher who lies? Real, good. I'm not there yet. I'm not, I cannot sit with you, Johnny, and honestly say to you at this very moment, well, brother, I'd rather be away from this body and with the Lord. I hear the whisper of it. My heart longs for it. But somehow I'm pretty attached to this thing, as rugged as it may look. There's something about this life that still anchors. You understand? I know, Franklin. I know. I know. I ain't talking about you. This is me. I'm not confessing you. I'm confessing my sin. (laughs) Franklin, I have a good time. But I want to tell you something. That's coming. Listen to me, the day's coming when Steve Watson will look at you face to face and you'll look me in the eyes and I'll say, for me to die, it's going to be the best day of my life on this earth. And you're going to look at me and think, my God, he believes it. And do you know, I want to tell you how I'm going to get there today. This sermon is actually for me. You get it, but it's for me. And I'm not kidding. I asked the Lord, how do I get there from here? We're going to talk about that. The other thing Paul said is, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. I hear it. I, I am, I'm beginning to actually take hold of the truth. And someday that truth is going to take hold of me. Let me say that again. I am hearing it. I am beginning to take hold of the truth. Someday that truth is going to take hold of me and consume me, and it will be jet fuel, and you'll wonder what happened to the old Steve. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Everybody should be saying, thank you, Lord. What happened to that old rascal? The new model's better. So so we say, how did this happen? Well, one of the things we know that happened with the Apostle Paul is that he writes in 2 Corinthians, I know a man in Christ. Now, who knows who Paul is talking about? Himself. I know a man in, in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I love that. I just love that. Uh, I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a human being is not allowed to speak. And as far as we know, Paul kept his mouth shut about that experience until he wrote this letter to the Corinthian church. Now, why he broke the silence then, only we know, but he still didn't utter the things he was told not to utter. But it shifts. When, when Stephen prayed that prayer, God must have heard it because Saul of Tarsus was standing 
Amen. That's right. That's good. That's good. Amen. Caught up into the third heaven. Now, I want to, as I was meditating on this yesterday, a statement out of a little book I read many, uh, several times over the years about the Moravian revival came to mind. This is from the Lord of the Ring, Phil Anderson. He writes this, It is an unfortunate fact that profound spiritual experiences do not always lead to lasting transformation. Now, I want to, I want to pause and ask you something. How many of you can think of somebody right now who has had a profound experience with the Lord and they're now not walking with the Lord? Raise your hand if that's you. Raise them and keep them up for just a moment. This is The, the Lord wants us to acknowledge this reality. See, we have profound experiences with the Lord, but what we need to understand is that experience is part of our journey, but it cannot be all we anchor into because it will not last. I had a most powerful experience with the Holy Spirit when I was in my mid-20s down at Camp Caswell, a Baptist camp. It was the most radical experience. To this day, I've never had a more powerful experience. Gosh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm even having trouble kind of remembering it now. So th the reason I wanted to point this out is that experience probably jet-fueled Paul's life, but it couldn't provide the fuel for the rest of his life. Now, the principle for that, Jesus speaks to, I believe, in Mark 4, 24, 25, when he says, by the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and more will be added. This is an important principle, by the way. Uh, for whoever has, more will be given to him, and whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is important. I'm just going to stop here for a moment because this has such application in general. The fact that we have an experience with the Lord is only an invitation into the room. If we go into the room, set up camp, and build house there, then that's when the thing begins to build. If you don't do that, you will lose what you got. Now, we need to understand that. Now, so here's the point I'm I want to make today. Paul had an incredible experience, probably one that maybe some of us might have, but most likely none of us will have this experience in this earthly life. But he did not anchor into that experience and run off of that the rest of his life. He didn't even mention it except for one time that we're aware of. So then now we say, well, what was the secret? I think the secret is in Colossians 3. So you got to understand, when Paul is speaking to the church, he is not some theologian telling them what they ought to do because he studied it in a book. Paul is the most real theologian the church has ever known. It's, ex it's about the experience of Christ in you, the hope of glory. So listen to me. When he says, so if you have been raised with Christ, now who's he talking to? He's talking to the church, born-again believers. Seek the things above. Now, I want to ask you something. Who do you think was seeking the things above? Can somebody say Paul? Who do you think was seeking the things above? In another place, he said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? So I want us to understand this. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But look at verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you're dead. <laughs> and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, this thing we want to understand, if you read the Apostle Paul and you read Jesus over and over and over again, they are bringing focus to heaven. A lot of times it's in this language, the day, the day of his return. Now, let's think about these two statements. Seek the things above 
set your minds on things above. I've been thinking about this. Holy Spirit gave me a whole week more to think about it. Somebody say, well, how do we do that? Let me give you a statement. This, by the way, this, this will, all of these slides will be a PDF and available online under our teaching things if you want to go back and get it. You don't have to worry about writing it down unless you want to. But this is, this is really all I want to impart to you today. After this, if you, if you lock in real good and we'll go after Jesus, you can leave. But otherwise, stay and I'll work on it some with you. The more we seek and, ex somebody say, and experience engagement with heaven, set our minds on the truths and realities of heaven, and consciously invest our lives toward heaven, the more real heaven will become to us. Now, I want you to re remember something, how I started today. This is for me. I need jet fuel. I can hear a call to something deeper than I've ever experienced of the Lord in my life. I feel this call to a revelation that I've never had, at, at least at this level. Have you ever had that happen where you know the Lord's pulling you somewhere? So what I want to know is, Lord, well, how do I follow? Jesus, how do I follow you where you're calling me to? Well, this is how he told me to follow him. So I want to talk with this. So number one, the more we seek and experience engagement in heaven. Uh, number two, set our minds on the truths and realities of heaven. Number three, consciously invest our lives toward heaven. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Every saint that has ever been able to say with honesty the things that, uh, the, the quote that I gave you before, it is because of this right here. They did, they did this. If they own it, they did this. They invested their lives in this. So I want to talk about what is this a little bit more. Seek and experience engagement with heaven. Look, new life. We just, I just did a, uh, an essentials class. Who, who, who was my class? Where are you at? Raise your hand. Don't be shy and ashamed. Of, there you are. Hallelujah. And one of the things we talk about uh, in that class uh, are, is the purpose of new life. Over the years, the Lord has, if you ask me as a pastor, what, what, what is your, I mean, you know, what's this about? What are you after? Well, there are five things. I've hit it. There are five things. I'm so laser focused on these. I read the Bible every morning and almost every morning I go back and look at these things and remind myself of what I'm after personally and what I'm responsible to do corporately with you all. Five, say five circles. Five. Number one, and, and by the way, I realized as I was meditating before the Lord this week, these five things are how you seek and experience engagement with heaven. This is how you do it. This is like uh, an idiot's guide to uh, seeking heaven. Now, you're not the idiot. I am. Increasingly learning to walk with God in the reality of a conversational relationship. Now, see, listen to me. I want to I I share with you four things and then kind of focus on the fifth for a brief moment. How does heaven become more real to us? Now, let me ask you this. In, in uh, Revelation 21, it tells us about the new heaven and the new earth coming. And, and, and it tells us that in that time, God is actually going to be with his people. Now, listen, this is what I want to say. A time is coming where he who I have known through a dark glass, Robert, I will see us face to face as I'm looking at you right now. He whom I have struggled to quiet my soul so I could hear his voice more clearly, I'm going to hear him as clearly, Steve, as if you were to say something to me right now. There is a day, see, there's a day, heaven and the new, I am going to be with him and it, there is going to be none of this frustration that I have experienced. But here's the deal, I can pursue that now. And the more of that I take hold of now, 
the more real it becomes of what I will one day experience in its fullness. Can you hear that? So listen, this thing about hearing, hearing God, learning to hear God, learning to walk with God in a conversational relationship, this has massive implications on this jet fuel that we're talking about. He's not going to talk to us here and lead our lives here and then dump us. We are the apple of his eye. He has a glorious plan for each and every one of his people. Think about this one. Increasingly come to know God's will and ways as we engage him in scripture. Now, how did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, let me ask you this. Is God's perfect will known in heaven? Watch me. Don't be nervous. Listen, there, there is no, one of my great pursuits, honestly, is all of these are actually what I pursue. This is, you are looking at my spiritual life right now. I'm, I'm giving it to you, trying to get you to go with me. Or those of you who are five miles ahead of you, I'm trying to hope you'll let me catch up with you. Amen. In this life, I have the great privilege of coming to know how God thinks, what he wants. Junior, it's incredible. It changes everything. Now, someday, that's not going to be a pursuit of mine because I will know it. I'll be in that environment. I'll be in the environment of heaven. Now, think about how this works. Uh, once um, Kelly and I, years ago, many years ago, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't, Oh, Jesus, I, please, Lord, once is good. But years ago, we had uh, one of my, my son, Lee, came back from Germany and brought his entire rock band with him and lived with us for a year. <laughs> Upstairs. It was the, it was like, I, I, I know grace is real because I had it for a year. <laughs> and I could tell you some stories. Um, but one of the things that happens if you live in somebody's house long enough, you become, you start to understand the ways and the will of the house. Do you understand? Those boys, it took them a while, but they began to adapt. And we began to adapt in some ways. Uh, but, but the ways and uh, will of the house, the core things did not change. If you're going to live under this roof, I don't care how old you are and how pretty you are and how good you can sing, you're going to adapt to the ways and the will of the house, right? So they came to fully know and understand the ways and the will in that year, right? All right, that's kind of the way we, we're learning the ways and the will of the house now. And wouldn't it be good when we get there that we're not shocked? Wouldn't it be good that we'd have some track record? We get there and think, my gosh, you're not the Lord I followed. I am like blown completely away. Come, can you hear this? Yes. Now, here's the point I want us to understand. The more we press into the scriptures, now who shows up in scripture as we press into the scripture? The Holy Spirit who gives, takes us into all truth, gives us all truth. We, we got to realize that we are actually tapping into heaven. The more we understand the will and ways of God, the more we're actually taking hold of what we're one day going to experience fully. Yes. If you can get your head there. Now, third thing. Increasingly be transformed, uh, becoming like Jesus from the inside out. I mean, I could, boy, could I go off on a tear here. Somebody say, hold, brother, hold. <laughs> we don't have time for that. This is like my passion. It's my passion right here. You know why? Because the times, oh, I told this to the class today, the times in which I have had doubt visit me about the very existence of God, do you know the thing that held me? I knew who I was pre-Jesus. Oh, that's right. It was a sad scene. 
I know the old Steve, and psychology cannot describe the transformation. Do you understand? Now, but what, I'm, what I've got to take hold of is that has held me in moments of belief, but what if it begins to take hold of me as this thing of giving me the, the jet fuel? Because doesn't Brother John tell us in his first epistle that one day, that day, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is? Do you understand that one day, this old body that, I mean, this old body that has been both a blessing and a curse will one day, day be nothing but a blessing to us? We're going to talk about that maybe next week. I mean, I'm not going to project anything in the future, you know. <laughs> God can do anything. He might be up to some stuff. All right, move on. I'm going to move on because I could get hung there. The fourth thing is increasingly learn how to live in and from God's always present kingdom. I think this is so important. I'm going to kind of focus. All of these things go together. You see how they overlap? Um, but here's what I want to challenge us to do. And these four things, by the way, we have been and are, being, are pursuing together. That's who we are. That's the, this house. Those are the things we are after. Now, the thing I want to ask us to tweak just a little bit, look at your neighbor and say, tweak just a little bit, is this fifth circle. Do all of this remembering that a day is coming when we will be with him in glory. So, so this is what, I, and, and I'm, we're going to look at something in just a minute. I want to try to emphasize just a little bit. But this is what the Lord has shown me to do. Every time God answers a prayer, Johnny, Every time I need to stop and pause and say, thank you, Lord, you're so kind, you're so good, you're powerful and wonderful, and this is a taste of what's coming. Somebody say, we're going to, see, we're going to look at this scripture. Somebody say, thank you for that taste, Lord. So li listen, let's reorient and begin to focus ourselves Look at this. The Holy Spirit, Paul writes, is the down payment. Somebody say down payment. Of our inheritance until what? The redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. You got you to get this. I mean, I don't think the Holy Spirit's offended if we call him the great down payment. Now, listen, we recently sold a house. And can somebody stop just a moment? Mary Jo, let's stop right now and give glory to God. Hallelujah. Every time I drive by that house, I honestly say, God, I am so grateful. And I bless them. They got a wonderful house. It was a wonderful house. Our time was just over. You understand, Brian? You know what I'm talking about, right? Part of that process, we got a down payment. And this is a new finagling thing. It's the kind... That they didn't have any, I mean, it was my money. I mean, it, when they gave me, I forget what, what'd you call, what'd they call that, Mary Jo? Due diligence. I didn't know there was such a thing. And they wrote us a check for $2,000. And, uh, and pa Pam was acting on Mary Jo's behalf. And I said, well, is there a possibility we'll have to give this back? <laughs> Because I had plans. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, no. So I, I asked her a second time. I wanted to clarify. <laughs> now, how many of you know that the $2,000 was a down payment of sorts? But aren't you glad I was so excited about the down payment that I forgot about the other $300 plus thousand dollars? Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people the most to be pitied. 
Now, what I want us to begin to think about is every time we celebrate a miracle, every time we celebrate a, celebrate a, revel, a revelation from God, every time your knees get weak because of the sweet presence of God, let's not forget this is not the end. It's a down payment. Yeah. It's part of the down payment. Can somebody see that? Am I the only one that's getting excited about heaven? I mean, I've spent my whole life, frankly, I mean, this is terrible. Living as if I were going to stay here forever. Now, don't worry, I'm not trying to rush out of here. But look, now, this is kind of, I'm going to have to take this from a, this is, this is a really powerful insight, so don't, let's not get sidetracked. You know, the book of Hebrews is written to those people we think who experienced that first great move of God. And some 30 plus years later, some of them were beginning to fall away or had fallen away and were getting weak and all of that stuff. You know, they had kind of left that first love or in some cases left the Lord altogether. And so the, the writer is writing a warning to those people. I don't want to talk about the warning. I want to talk about the nugget of truth in the warning. Look at what it says. He speaks of those who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the power of what? Coming age. The coming age. What do you think he's talking about? Heaven. But I want to draw your attention to a word that's used twice. Taste it. You guys have been to Sam's. I don't know if they I don't know if they operate in the gift of manipulation at Costco or not. I've never been there. They do. So they've got people whose job it is to give you a taste of something, hoping you will spend your hard-earned money to buy a box of it. How many know that you would have to make yourself pretty obvious to go to Costco or to Sam's and trot around there long enough to have lunch? <laughs> Can somebody say a taste? A taste. Now, I want I, I wanted, I wanted to make sure we got this. This is like a deep spiritual revelation. So I wanted to show us where this word is used another time in the New Testament. You remember the story. Um, I'm going to have to look up here. Um, where Jesus turned the water into wine, it says the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine. Now let's get our, let's get our put our thinking caps on here just a minute. The master of the feast probably didn't even drink a good glass of wine. Goblet. A goblet. Thank you. I was looking for that, frankly. That's why we're a good team, you know. <laughs> He got a taste. That must have been some taste. He probably never got over that taste for the rest of his life on this earth. <laughs> he probably shocked him, set him down. The chosen has had so many good moments, but I'm not sure they I'm not sure they captured the absolute awesomeness of that moment or not. That's right. Probably quit. Just said, well, I ain't going to drink no more wine until till heaven. If they have, oh, we shouldn't say that because some of us are ex-Baptist in here. We don't, we don't go for that. Sorry, just ignore that last comment. But you get the point, right? The second thing is set our minds on the truths and realities of heaven. We're going to talk about this more next week or whenever. Uh, and we're going to focus on three things because it's such a big topic. Um, the promise to those who died before the Lord's coming, we're going to look at that, at the, at the truths and realities of what the Bible says about that. The promises included in the day of His coming and the promises related to the new heavens and the new earth. So we're going to look at basic things. And all next week is meant to be, or whenever we do it, is nothing but an appetizer. It is an invitation. You cannot exhaust it. 
Now listen, whether you take the bait or not will be up to you and the Lord. I've done, I've done swallowed hook, line, and sinker. The guy who probably has, Randy Alcorn, probably has more revelation about heaven than any living human being right now. That guy read, I think, if my numbers are correct, he poured over the Bible for years and years, looking for every inkling it gave about heaven. He read 148 books that were written in the last 100 years about heaven. Now, how many of you can say, dude, you're hungry? <laughs> now, here's the point. Is it any surprise that that guy has more revelation about heaven than any breathing human being today? Now, if you were to trot Randy and I up, you know, kind of put us in a lineup and say, we're going to talk about those who have revelation of heaven today. You could say we have this end of the spectrum and we have this end of the spectrum. And I'm over here and Randy's over there. Can somebody say it's about pursuit? He who has and pursues, more will be given, right? So, and one of the things, this is what I love about the spiritual truths. They don't convince your mind. They take over your heart. And you begin to see things that you read with your eyes or hear with your ears. Those things, do, they, they take over your heart. They begin to consume your heart. And you know, the entry price for that is time and attention. I, I, go, I, I never go to Scripture hoping it'll be alive to me. After 40 plus years, it's a living book. And any truth that I focus on, it's going to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger, and it will overtake my heart if I give attention to it. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So we're going to talk about, we're at least going to point our direction uh, in that direction, right? Oh, okay. All right. You with me? You're not, you're not going to lunch yet, right? Because I got one more thing I want to say to you. And uh, this was really revolutionary to me. The first two things, I'll be honest with you, I've, I'm like, okay, I get that, but now I'm actually fueled to go after it. Um, but this week, the Lord nailed me with something, and it's like it has revolutionized everything for me. I've got a suspicion I'm not going to be nearly as grumpy going forward. And some of you are going to say, dang, brother, you're kind of late to the party. <laughs> but the third thing is consciously invest our lives toward heaven. Now let's think about what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So let's read this together, verse 21. For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. This is powerful. I don't know how I didn't see this before. Carolyn, it's like every time. Let's look at one more verse and then I'll go into what the Lord's right. He's rocking me with the scripture right now. And this is the scripture, uh, Galatians 6, 9 through 10. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially and especially to those who are the, of the household of faith. How do you explain when the Lord takes a scripture you've read for 42 years and he suddenly explodes it as if you've never read it before? This has changed everything. Every time, now let's pause for just a minute, by the way, because we live in a, a, an information deluge. And I don't know about you, 
But the need in the earth and the communication coming to me, frankly, has paralyzed my compassion. And I'm over it. I'm mad about it. And the Holy Spirit took this scripture. He exploded it. That, that Greek word, so then as we have opportunity, that word in the Greek is karos. It's, it's a window of time. A window opens to you. This is a Holy Spirit and you encounter. And I've begun to discover, listen, this is what's happening. The Holy Spirit opens my heart to a circumstance, a situation, or a person. I, 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 I'm getting... I mean, I've been burdened by Ukraine since this whole war started, and I've been mad since it started. And I've been paralyzed about what to do. And then the other week, Mike shares with me this vision that, that he and the ministry he's part of has about, uh, you, for $500, you can send a, um, a generator to Ukraine. And no, Eric shared it, and then I talked to Mike, and I don't know how to explain, how does this happen? Suddenly, what happened was a karos opened. In that moment, this vast problem of horror and hurt and pain and death and suffering that I felt paralyzed to do anything about, in a moment's time, by the Holy Spirit, a window opened into my heart, and I knew in that moment, Steve... As you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are the household of faith. And then the Lord began to show me. You write a check because a window of opportunity opened in your heart. You had this experience with the Lord where he's saying... It's a big world. There's a lot going on. Don't get paralyzed. But you can do something about this one, and I'm with you in it. And it ain't about feeling good about yourself. This is what the Lord showed me. Every time you do that, in whatever form it takes... heaven will expand to you. Your heart and your grasp of heaven will open a little more. I, I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I'm preaching it too early after the revelation. Personally, I don't know. This has revolutionized me. I have become, I'm not a paralyzed man anymore. And I'm also, I'm also not trotting around writing checks everywhere. <laughs> Everybody say, thank God. You, you understand. But I'm walking with a living, breathing Savior who hurts for the world, but he's not paralyzed by the pain. And he gives me the privilege of joining him here. 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 And the, and the ultimate thing, Rick, it was never about my checkbook. It was always about my heart. This changes everything. We no longer feel guilty for what we don't do. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us recognize what we should do and could do. Join him there and then invite him and thank him for expanding our hearts because I have some invest I have more investment now in what's coming. I don't know if you can see that or not. So here we go. Karen, you guys come up. We're gonna Land it with the. Well, this is the one thing I'm. You know, if I lost you there during the last thirty minutes or so, wake up. <laughs> 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 it 
it's still not too late to get the message. Because <laughs> this is the message. Now, I want to ask you something as I'm closing. Some of you are so shocked. I hope you didn't wet yourself. <laughs> You got to say that to people our age, you know, many of us. <laughs> but can you imagine for a minute? I want to ask you something corporately now. Can you imagine the impact of a group of people to whom the reality of heaven had become their primary passion in life? Can you imagine how those people might live and the impact those people might have? Can you imagine how unselfish that kind of person will become? <laughs> Can you imagine how much of the authority and power of heaven God might entrust to those people? Can you imagine how much revelation and understanding of spiritual things God might say, I can trust you with this? I think it's a lot. So let's go after it together. Amen? Amen? Let's go after it together. One, two, three. I'm not going to read it again. You can go online and get it, download it. One, two, three. Get that in your minds. If some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, man, I so wish heaven were real to me. I wish if I were faced with some challenge that fear would not grip me. I wish, you know, I would. Well, I've got good news for you. There is a path which for 2,000 years of church history, the saints of old have tread. And that's it. That's it. I'll close with this one thought because I was thinking about, you know, as you get older, and, I, you know, I put up, uh, who was that I did the quote by? What was his name? Huh? I, Moody. Moody, yes, thank you. I get him and Spurgeon mixed up for some reason. They're both old, dead, white guys, so I can get them mixed up. But I was meditating on this uh, yesterday. And I want to speak to you young people for a minute as we close. That tickled me. That quote tickled me. It, it, it just was exciting and fun. But the most penetrating quote I've ever heard in the history of the church came from a 23-year-old man written in his journal by the name of Elliot. Wasn't it just Jim? You may remember that. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. to take hold of what he cannot lose. 23-year-old. 23 years old. I thought of that yesterday. I was, I was making a drive, a long drive, and, and I thought to myself, God, how? I'm 64 years old. How did this young guy, 23 years old, come to that? How? I'm still baffled. But I say that because I'm saying your generation is going to shake the world in a way we never have. But you won't be one of the shakers unless you have heaven as your primary destination in your heart and mind. And I'm telling you prophetically now, I'm going to shift from pastorally to prophetic. The Lord is giving an invitation today to those who will respond and say, I want that heart. And I'm just going to leave it at that, Karen. You guys take it from here. And we'll just let the Lord sort it out, okay? Let the Lord do what he's going to do.